Hello everyone, this is Space Cafe Podcast and I am Marcus. We usually produce remotely. The Space Cafe Podcast is a child of the pandemic, so to say, that has advantages and disadvantages. Of course, that makes it all the more exciting when you finally sit down face-to-face -face with a real person. In the current case, I took a detour to Moribaja on a trip to the United States, a small suburban house, sparse but cozy, VR gear, a coffee maker, bottled water, a sofa, and some dumbbells. I think that's about it. The gear of a visionary. All right. Moriba, you ready? Yeah, absolutely. Cool. A NASA fellowship as a student, Los Alamos National Laboratory, Jet Propulsion Laboratory, Mars Global Surveyor, Mars Odyssey, and Mars Exploration. An expert in spacecraft deceleration. And I guess that's just what the man needs. Moriba is a visionary on steroids with a mission, a goal. His mission is to reduce space debris pollution. In 2021, Moriba co-founded Privateer Space with Apple co-founder Steve Wozniak and Alex Fielding, where he serves as chief scientist. Moriba makes no secret about the predicament we're in when it comes to space debris, but Moriba wouldn't be Moriba if he didn't have solutions to offer. And this is where it gets really exciting. His solutions require nothing less than a reinterpretation of our view of humanity. And that's where my heart goes nuts. Welcome, Moriba Ja, to the Space Cafe podcast. So in the room with Moriba Ja, um, welcome. Thank thanks, you, thank for, you. thanks for having me today. Absolutely. So let's talk about your latest and greatest venture that's going on. This is definitely one of your milestones so far, right? It yeah. just dawned on me uh, some years ago that, you know, in my work, there's just no way to get enough resources to really make this something scalable, global. And um, I very much see that we're in a new renaissance. And when I look at the original Renaissance and, you know, what really came together to help art and science flourish during the original Renaissance. Um, it wasn't just these grants from governments and stuff that made that happen. It was one particular family that came together to make that happen. And those were the Medici hmm. in Florence. And so right. the thing that I've been asking myself is, you know, where's my Medici equivalent? Where can I find the Medici equivalent to right. really help with this? Right. And then Steve Wozniak and Alex Fielding show up. Wow. And, and, and all of a sudden, it's like, here's a privateer. Like, so so how, how did you approach them? Did they, you, they did you tell me, them about the Medici? You, well, they found me. And the thing is, here's the thing. Like, Alex very much is a lover of the Renaissance as well. I mean, mm. I imagine Steve as well. But Alex was very familiar with the Medici. So he loved that. Nice. Yeah. Nice. Awesome. So um, you met them, you pitched your project to them, or how was that? So basically, they said, we've been following you, your work for some time. Wow. Um, That's nice already. That was <laughs> nice, right. And they said, we want to build something around this vision. Mm. And, and, you know, are you willing, and, and how willing are you to, to, to do this kind of with us? And mm. I said, yeah, absolutely. I mean, this is my life's work. Mm. And, um, you know, some people say, you know, the message and the messenger two different things. And with me, they, they aren't. Hmm. Um, there's no separation between me and the message, and right. uh, which could be a very scary thing. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, all of me is poured into my work and, and privateer. Tell me, tell me, Maury, but let's go back to the initial problem. So what is the problem you're trying to get rid of? Right. So the problem that we're really looking at is we see uh, a space environment that lacks environmental protection. We see that the way that humans have behaved on land, air, and ocean, we're seeing that in space. Um, we see that we might have an environment that we might lose the ability to interact with 
because of the amount of pollution and these sorts of things. And to see that, you know, humanity ultimately has to be successful at being uh, spacefaring uh, and eventually even becoming interstellar as a species. And, you know, if, if we can't do that, then humanity's expiration date is certain. So no time better than the present to work on these things. But how do we avoid getting in our own way to become an interstellar uh, species? And so there's decision-making knowledge required to help a variety of stakeholders, some of which are just trying to keep themselves safe on orbit, others that want to monitor space actor behavior for compliance or lack thereof, um, companies that want to clean the debris, but they're like, oh, well, before I go get it, what's its size, its shape? What is it made out of? If I, if I touch it, is it brittle? Is it just going to break up? Because that would be a bad day. Um, there's no database where that information currently exists. So privateer wants to be that foundational layer that says we want to, we're here to enable people in achieving great things that are going to be to humanity's benefit. Hmm. So how big is the problem at the moment? Yeah. I mean, look, at this point, we're uh, tracking about 50,000 objects ranging in size from cell phone to the space station. Uh, 90% of those are garbage. They're not working. Every few weeks, we're launching more and more satellites. Uh, the launches and the operations of these satellites across humanity is, as of yet, uncoordinated. Mm -hmm. We're just making decisions without knowing how other people are making decisions. Mm -hmm. So it's def this is definitely like a recipe for disaster. A tragedy of the commons mm -hmm. is on the horizon unless we do something different. Mm -hmm. And so that's that's part of the problem for sure. Well, so so what time frame do we have? That means hard. <laughs> uh, we need to do more analysis to understand these things. And in fact, one of the things that I feel is missing is uh, you know s space sustainability metrics. So something like a carbon footprint analog for space that I call a space traffic footprint. Think of it as the burden that any given object poses on the safety and sustainability of anything else. And I tell people when I get in my vehicle and I get out of my garage, um, I am not a burden to all other pedestrians and drivers. And even mm -hmm. if they see me and know every move that I'm going to make, the fact that they have to take my presence into account for their own safety mm -hmm. constitutes a burden. Mm -hmm. So the same thing with objects in space, objects that are alive, even if you can predict them exactly, you have to take it into account to keep your own self safe. Mm -hmm. And so if we can assign that space traffic footprint to all these objects and then say, within each of these orbital highways, there's a carrying capacity that can be saturated. And the saturation of the carrying capacity is when our decisions and actions can no longer prevent some percentage of undesired outcomes from happening. So if we say, okay, we have this sun synchronous orbit. Um, we're trying to be safe. We're trying to move out of the way, but we see that we still have collisions and these sorts of things. That means that the carrying capacity has been reached and that orbit by all intents and purposes is no longer operationally useful. Hmm. And so if we can assign... Like for, for how long? Forever. Forever? Yeah. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. So, so, so unless something, unless there's a, unless capacity is given back to the mm -hmm. orbit. Mm -hmm. So that's where the debris cleaning and that sort of stuff comes into play. Because if we can assign these sustainability metrics, we can say, okay, for this sun-synchronous orbit, this is the combined space traffic footprint. This is the carrying capacity. These are the countries that are taking the capacity in this orbit, and most of this stuff is due to junk, mm -hmm. then you can go to the space garbage cleaning people and say, hey, this much money to remove this amount of the space traffic footprint, which then provides this much capacity back to this orbit so that somebody can put something useful sure. in that highway. I understand the problem, I understand the concept, but is it really feasible and realistic to clean up the mess up there. Because I mean, like to clean up and maybe grab and deorbit an outdated satellite, that's doable. But I think 
The problem is the smaller pieces, the really small pieces traveling at, at extreme velocities. So is that all like more than a theoretical discussion? So I think, um, I think near space will forever be polluted, just like we're never going to get rid of microplastics in the oceans. Mm -hmm. So we have to learn to live with that and that there's always going to be the small stuff that we're just not going to be able to do anything about. And if we can start understanding the behavior of the small stuff and have, uh, have hypotheses on how to figure that out, then we might be able to predict over which time scales is the space environment going to naturally cleanse some of this stuff or whatever. Because look, mother nature, uh, in all of my work, mother nature always seeks equilibrium. So long as there isn't this, uh, anthropogenic input, right? So if, if humans cease and desist and let mother nature do stuff, mother nature will try to reach an equilibrium point. You know, with COVID, it was like, okay, you know, people could like see through the canals in Venice, animals were coming out because people weren't traveling all the time. So mother nature always seeks equilibrium, which is the reason I don't believe in Kessler syndrome because, because that, 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 that's this runaway cascading never stops and, and, I've never seen anything in nature that behaves that way. So, um, but the thing is, without doing the analysis, we don't let Mother Nature give us the feedback mechanism to let us know what the unintended consequences are of our actions and be able to say, okay, over the next several hundred years, if, if we behave in the right way, this problem kind of goes away a bit because of natural cleansing mechanisms and these sorts of things. Cool. So now, Let's go back to privateer. So when is privateer starting to clean or help clean up the mess up there? So immediately. So we already rolled out our website on, on March 1st. It's a great website, by the way. So whoever designed that, congrats. Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah. I mean, um, yes, it, it, everything very intentional. And again, the spirit it is really, it's about connection with humanity um, you know, interconnectedness and stewardship. And so Wayfinder is like the first thing that we put out there, which looks a lot like Astrograph because mm -hmm. it's yeah. basically Astrograph now operationalized and scaled, um, to, to be more useful. And so, uh, you know, the reason for, for Wayfinder is, you know, in connecting with indigenous, uh, cultures, especially like, you know, the, the headquarters for privateers is on Maui. Uh, so we're very connected mm -hmm. to the Hawaiian, uh, uh, culture and this trade craft of wayfinding is all about having a successful conversation with the environment. So if, if, you, if, and it's not clearly that wayfinding is, a, you know, about the ocean, but if you, you know, speak to native Hawaiians, this trade craft of wayfinding applies to many other parts of life. And it means, um, look, if you're going to act with the environment in order for you to be able to exist and do so sustainably, again, you need to understand what the feedback mechanisms are from uh, Mother Nature, the canoe. You need to be monitoring what is the environment doing to your canoe, its structural integrity, how far can you push that. <laughs> you have a leader that you have to be able to trust with your own life, and that leader has to be able to trust you. So there's symmetric dependency. Mm -hmm. um, all these things, right? The, the, the being able to understand the currents, the clouds, the birds and how they fly. And, you know, all these things are integrated to achieve the ability to keep on living and do so harmoniously. So our app wayfinder is basically taking that spirit and saying, this is something to help people figure out what's on orbit. Who does it belong to? What is it doing? Uh, make things more predictable and develop a body of evidence that can help support, uh, you know, these debris cleaning businesses. And so to your point, right now, there's no catalog or database of objects that goes beyond just talking about orbits. And most people model these things as if they were spheres, but, you know, uh, without mentioning specific companies, but we've been approached to say, Hey, my debris cleaning technology doesn't work on everything like it here's the first you know it doesn't work for things that are larger than blank smaller than blank tumbling at a certain rate 
made out of this sort of a material, but there's no place to go look that up. And so one of the things that we're developing is extending the catalog beyond the cannonball and being able to ascribe these physical characteristics to objects and do so increasingly. Hopefully the, the goal is for, to characterize everything. Um, so that we can, you know, provide this information to help support, you know, these businesses. Are you still looking for talent for privateer? So if Absolutely. Uh, people want to do come on board to help. Yeah. And so, so basically on the privateer website, uh, if you go to privateer.com, you'll see Wayfinder in the upper right, you'll see mission. If people click there, then they'll see exactly what our core values and all that stuff. If you go all the way to the bottom, there's some links where people can send their CVs and that sort of thing. For sure. What are you about? Tell me about you, you. You were mentioning time and again the connection to Mother Nature, the connection to indigenous cultures. Have we lost our connection? As uh, I'm talking about Western cultures, because uh, we're part of that culture. So, how have we lost our connection to the planet? And do we need to relearn that? And why is that? important for high-tech projects like space travel. Yeah, I think that Western civilization has lost touch with that connection. Um, they've, they've abandoned stewardship for ownership. And, oh, I own this. This is mine. I can exercise these rights. I see Western culture trying as hard as possible. Everybody wants to be independent. Mm -hmm. Everybody wants to be in the position of, I don't need you. Exactly. I can do everything on my own. But we're social animals still. Right. But the thing is, when people, when people believe themselves to be independent, their behavior is such that it tends to be detrimental to everybody else. So one of the things that we're trying to do with Privateer is to use space as humanity's mirror to show humanity, definitely Western culture, actually, you believe yourself to be independent, but it's not so. Everything is interconnected. Here's evidence of the dependency. You can say you're independent, but really, here's how all these other decisions are actually affecting you. And I think that if people can actually see the evidence of that interconnection and realize that there's dependency, the thing that I want to then do is say, I want to grow dependency, but I want the dependency to be symmetric. If we can have symmetric dependency, then when we behave with each other, we do so knowing, oh, I need to be mindful because I need something from all these folks. Sure. They need something from me. And harmony can be achieved that way. On my way to, to, to that interview, the Uber driver, we had a beautiful discussion. The Uber driver said he believes that the solution to almost everything is education. So I, and I think I could agree more. Uh, because I believe once you understand um, what humanity is all about, has been all about, 200,000 years, Homo sapiens, how we evolved, once you understand that story, you will understand that we are trapped in a narrative that was invented a couple of decades ago about individualism because it's part of a neoliberal um, um, narrative. Um, so that was that was a fun moment to to realize that Uber drivers think very deeply um, on short drives. Absolutely. Well, well so, so I, I love that. And, and here's somebody recently interviewed me and asked me, what do I feel is the biggest challenge to achieving my vision and that sort of stuff? And I said, it's being able to bridge the lack of empathy. So I didn't feel it was technology. Policy is hard. Empathy is hardest. And empathy can generally be defined as the ability to project oneself into the conditions and situations of others to where you can resonate and understand others, other perspectives. And I feel that um, at best, when people are just, because people say, oh, well, we need more awareness. No, no, no. Awareness is necessary but insufficient because at best, when people are aware, They're like, oh, okay, I'm aware that you have this problem, but that's your problem. It's not my problem. And at worst, it's I don't give a fuck. Right. 
you know, that's the worst part of awareness is, oh, I'm aware and I don't give right. a fuck, right? So the thing is, I'm going to go beyond the awareness to then say, how do I present this information? How do I tell this story in such a way that is compelling and enables people to project themselves into this different perspective to then say, ah, I can now feel the pain and the struggle and I see that there's interconnectedness. So that problem is actually my problem. And the space debris problem is my problem. Right. Even if I have nothing to do with the space industry, but exactly. this is my sphere that's I right. live in, I'm part of. And that is my goal. Mm -hmm. That is where I'm going to, that's what I see as the hardest challenge that I face mm. is getting to that. And which is the reason why I'm really pushing for space environmentalism to become mainstream. It's the reason why I'm getting more involved in podcasts. I'm actually looking at developing a TV uh, series called Shifted Space, where I'm kind of like a Tony Bourdain for space mm -hmm, and I travel mm -hmm. the world. And I want to do this to connect more with humanity and get them to resonate, to try to create empathy. Towards but them. I mean, like, we can't even solve our problems here on Earth. So if I'm looking out on the street, I mean, like, there's trash everywhere. So why would it be different in space? So here's what I'm hoping. I'm hoping that somehow I'm guided within to find these ingredients that when I put together and talk about space, it actually helps people understand the problem here on Earth even more. And um, right now, when I look at, uh, you know, the war going on in Ukraine uh, with Russian invasion and all this other stuff, the reason why we can turn on the news and see what's happening, these sorts of things, There, there are data that we use that are uniquely provided by satellites. If these things disappear, there's a lot that we wouldn't know. Space helps us understand the Earth more than we ever did before in ways that we can only understand by using space as a mirror. That is kind of my message in space environmentalism is if for no other reason, space lets us know more about us in ways that If we take advantage of this information, we can actually turn the tides because there's still hope to recover. There's still hope to achieve harmony. And I want to use that. Mm -hmm. I think it's also important to understand that space is already embedded in our everyday lives as our cars and trains and buses and houses. Uh, space is not something tomorrow. Space is right now. Now, I think this is something we need to understand. And we have no understanding because it's so far away and we don't see it. So we don't see our satellites, sometimes Elon's constellation, right. but we don't see it. And I think this is a, the same problem for climate change. We cannot see it. It's too slow. It's too, so, too right. out there. Right. And, and we have no cognitive ability, I, I must say, or to, right. I think, to, to understand that. And this is why we're lacking an ability to produce empathy. Right. So here's, here's, so this is brilliant. Um, this may sound very weird and I'm okay with that because I, love, <laughs> I, I love, I love doing this with you, Marcus, and, and saying things that might sound weird, but my, my prediction, my hypothesis is the following. One of the reasons why a lot of my work has a center in computational technologies is because I believe the only way for humanity to understand and comprehend this level of interconnectedness, the climate change and everything that we're doing, machines are going to have to show that to us. Mm -hmm. This is a complex system. It's hyperdimensional. It has interdependencies that are nonlinear. All this, it has so much complexity in it. Humans are very good at providing context to things, but we're not so good at going through hyperdimensional data cubes to find insights. This is where AI and machine learning are going to come to the rescue to say, given all the evidence from all these different sources, here's, 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 here's what 
what I can pull out of this. And I'm showing you how interconnected things are. I'm showing you that the butterfly that flapped its wings yesterday, this chain of events happened and it resulted in this other thing across the globe. This volcano that erupted over here in the Pacific, here's evidence from satellite imagery and these other things that shows you how that wave went around the globe and affected somebody, uh, you know, in China, for instance. This is what machines are uniquely positioned to be able to show us, and that is exactly what I intend to do, is above this kind of environmentalism platform is basically enlist the help of machines to come through with this massive data set that I'm trying to aggregate for ourselves to pull these insights to show humanity, look, we created machines, and machines are showing us back to the path to our common source. <laughs> How far would you go with, with machines? Should machines at some point have executive power, power in our societies? I'm, I'm asking because yeah. I read a beautiful book by a German author. It's called The Cube. And The Cube is a supercomputer. And the German government, in a couple of decades to come, decided to hand over uh, executive and, and governmental responsibility and power to that supercomputer. And that book tries to analyze in a fictional world what that world looks like and um seems like <clears throat> the germans in that book uh for the most part liked it a bunch of issues came along with it of course a very fictional world but how far would you go so um i'm going to say this i would not give machines this executive power yet because uh i don't think humanity would like the decisions that machines might make. Of course, maybe get rid of humanity because it's bad for the planet. Exactly. That's exactly <laughs> And right. it would be reasonable. That's exactly right. So I think that if, if basically <laughs> we program compassion into machines, they, machines might get rid of humans because that's the most compassionate thing <laughs> for the universe. Exactly. So I don't, I want to yeah. wait for a little Sure, bit. sure. An, an upgrade. <laughs> that's right. Exactly. Great. I like that. Uh, I really like that. Th thanks for taking the time, Moriba. This is this is very deep. But I think, I think we need to go deeper um, still as humans. I think we're very much on the surface. I mean, like building rockets, doing new space. This is necessary, but still not enough. This is we need more visionary thinking. Yeah, and so so I'm going to go back to something I had said in the beginning is that. We cannot rest until we become interstellar. Yeah. And, and, and the reason I say that, right, is because um, eventually our sun dies. Mm -hmm. That will happen with absolute certainty in four billion years. But when the sun dies, it's all over. It is for this solar system. And so the thing is, right now, we don't have the ability for interstellar travel. And some people might say, oh, a billion years is a long time. I can tell you what's going to happen uh, if we do nothing, right, we're done. No time better than the present to start working on interstellar travel. And Elon is focused on multi-planet species. Sure, that is maybe along the path to being interstellar, but we need to do that. And the other thing, too, is even if we say, all right, so the sun fizzes out in a, a billion years or whatever, what else can happen between now and then? Well, We do have evidence of dinosaur bones. Mm, exactly. And the thing is, is that statistically, we will get hit by another asteroid. Now, I will say this. We saw something impact the moon, mm -hmm. this Chinese rocket. People are like, oh, well, you know, the moon and kind of who cares? I mean, it's just one rocket and all this other stuff. I want, one rocket too much. You know, yeah. I want people to look at the moon and feel grateful to the moon. And... And here's one of the things that I said to a reporter recently, and they said, wow, I've never really thought of it, you know, that way. The moon is part of us. Mm -hmm. We've, we evolved in the system, right? But even going beyond that, when people look at the moon at night and they see the craters, each crater that somebody sees, they should be thinking to themselves, that's a crater that we don't have on Earth. The moon is a shield, There's so many asteroids that the moon has basically deflected and pulled. Mm. The moon has protected the Earth over and over again and continues to do that. The, the moon's critical. 
that that is also to say the moon can't shield us from everything and we already have evidence of uh globally ending events due to you know asteroid impacts statistically that's going to happen um there's no reason to believe it won't and so to me that's another reason that we should think in an accelerated manner we need to find a way to thrive elsewhere right right maybe with a more sustainable mindset then definitely we shouldn't we shouldn't bring our earthly mindset with us that's right so how it needs to be altered right right so um what prevents us right now to get there right now is it technological problems mostly because i mean like what prevents us from building a star trek type spaceship i mean like i'm not talking about the 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 traveling the thruster technology so that kind of technology may be a little too out there but what prevents us from building a huge city-sized spacecraft i think the thing that really prevents it is the fact that we see ourselves as individuals <laughs> and we're all different countries yeah. and nations yeah and we don't see ourselves as one humanity and the thing is if we could see ourselves in this problem as one humanity then it would shouldn't make, be an issue that's right considering what we're spending exactly. day by day that's for right. warfare yeah <laughs> so we could get a bunch of nice spaceships that's right on a daily basis okay and you're going to have the countries that are the wealthiest ones they're going to say well that means that we're going to be putting most of the resources so most of our people should take advantage of this or most of our uh most of the decisions should come from us and most so it's back to this scorecard instead of seeing it as no we're one humanity and everybody has something to bring to the table yeah i guess most people um clean up their place when they're leaving to go somewhere else so at least i would do that so when i'm going on vacation or i'm traveling i would clean up my space my place back home um if you are now envisioning humanity going somewhere else i think we should clean up earth before we go absolutely i agree with that because this is earth has been has been our home for such a long time it's the so only one it's our duty it's our duty to give something back to earth so i agree because i was i was wondering when you're saying we should become interplanetary interstellar are we running away from something and so the, so the thing is i want it not to be looked at that way i want it to be looked at as this is what's required to extend the expiration date on humanity but i agree that we need to take care of and clean the earth and i feel that it's within our capability to actually do that do you have the feeling that something maybe going into in the right direction at the moment do you have a feeling that people are reacting or are we still not there yet when it comes to developing a planetary awareness planetary consciousness we're not there yet and we're not there yet but are we beginning to make the first step or are we not there yet either i don't think we're there yet either <laughs> with making the first step to planetary consciousness i mean i see a couple of pockets of people that are trying to go in that direction mm. but it's just not mainstream mm. you know this idea of, of of planetary consciousness is just not a mainstream idea i think that uh to some extent if we can get help from you know the arts and hollywood and these sorts of things that could actually help quite a bit more so than just scientists and engineers talking about this stuff mm. you know what's crazy uh speaking about hollywood i'm in the film industry um And I get to pitch documentaries uh, on, on a regular basis. And the problem, so very recently, I pitched a documentary about the methane issue, climate change and whatnot. And so when you get to talk to scientists, they would usually tell you that the big problems will arrive around 2,100. Uh, so then you approach um, Hollywood, um, As, as a placeholder for the for the entire entertainment industry and they would say well 2100 that's still too far away for us so it's not a story yet 
And I mean, like, that's the mindset we have. 2,100, that could be our children already, but we don't care. We don't even care about the future of our own children these days. So how you are, are you planning? So what keeps you motivated in, in all that, Moriba? Because I realize that, um, you know, different phenomena act at very different timescales. And because I believe in this interconnectedness, I know that the thing that I do now has a nonlinear cause, yeah. a nonlinear effect, mm. uh, you know, hundreds of years from now. So I, but it's back to, we just don't see the evidence. Like when you t say to Hollywood, hey, 2100, oh, well, who cares? Because that's too far away. If there was evidence that kind of shows that connective tissue, then people in Hollywood might say, oh, wow, okay. Mm, sure. I can, sure. Now I'm seeing something, whether it's computer simulation or whatever, that shows mm. what the ripple effects mm. are. We just need more of that mm. evidence. Mm. So next steps, privateer. What's, what's, what's coming up? Look, I mean, you know, still in this idea of, of stewardship and interconnectedness, you can expect to see more things coming out for space safety, collision, conjunction analysis, that sort of stuff. Uh, you know, based on crowdsourcing data, I think you can expect to see a growing database of objects that describes things more in terms of their physical traits, not just their orbits. I think you're going to see stuff coming out that's going to be monitoring and assessing space actor behavior for compliance or lack thereof of different treaties, laws, rules, regulations, and that sort of stuff. Seeing who owns, what are the launching states associated with any given object in terms of liability and damage. Um, I think you're going to see stuff related to um, how to help astronomers predict light pollution uh, for, for that mm -hmm. impact mm -hmm. their science. So I think near term, those are the sorts of things you're going to see come out of mm. private tier. So if now um, people with a little spare time left are listening, um, space debris removal is a multi-trillion dollar business in the future, I guess. So if one wanted to make money, maybe this is the way to go. Yeah, and, and if certainly if we have these sustainability metrics like the space traffic footprint and orbital carrying capacity, then it makes absolute sense, um, you know, how much you would charge and that sort of stuff to, to help, you know, mitigate the environmental impact. Clearly, we're also speaking to space insurance companies and how to bring them on board because they can help regulate the space traffic. Because we, we, we haven't said that uh, clear enough I, I think if we do not solve that problem there will not be space travel in 20 30 years absolutely so there are going to be entire orbital highways that will be useless yeah and i see you know i know most of humanity says well who cares about space tourism i'm not going to be on that anytime soon um i see uh friends of mine you know dylan taylor went up recently George Neild is going to be going up, uh, you know, in Blue Origin pretty soon. These are people that I know. And these are people that I call my friends. Um, they're putting at themselves at great risk and going up because there's a bunch of quote unquote random bullets that are just flying around that could, you know, end their lives. It's not going to be, this is not like getting on a plane. So this is like, this is like, um, walking into a bar, a Wild West in right. the saloon That's right. days. Exactly. <laughs> you it's never know. That's right. Walking in the saloon with wire, right? <laughs> it's crazy. And we we have our story here, uh, yes. our analogy. Um, Moriba, how can people follow follow your tribe? Yeah, look, um, I think if people just go to privateer.com and 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 again check that out and go and click on the mission, um, you're going to see a lot of links and ways to subscribe. And um, really, we're trying to connect with people. This is a humanity's problem. And uh, you're going to see more and more ways to engage with us as the next uh, few months uh, roll out because we, we just got out of stealth mode. And privateer, I guess the main model here is our success only comes from the success of everybody else. We're here to be partners. We're here to be collaborators. We're brothers. We're sisters. We're friends. Um, that's who we are. Cool. At the end of our show, we usually do our inspiration, coffee, um, espresso spiel. Um, so why don't you share an espresso for the mind with us right now? Um, what is it that you would like to share when it comes to inspiration?
inspiring people? What inspires you? It doesn't need to be space-related, whatever. Maybe it's a book, it's a, it's a movie, or whatnot. What do you think could be an inspiration for our audience? You know, um, I look at life and the condition of life around, around the world right now, and I see uh, a growing number of people that actually believe that there's something positive that we can do to turn things around. And, um, you know, when I meet with students and with the youth and with kids, uh, I see it in their eyes that they're, they don't want to inherit a world, uh, that is going down the tube, so to, so to speak. So my inspiration comes from, uh, from mostly from children and, um, see, seeing the potential for us to actually, you know, fix our problems. And so I, I carry that very near and dear to my heart. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you for being on the show, Mori Bacha. Thank you so much, Marcus. Anytime, brother. Missions like this need support, no matter who you are out there and what your capabilities are. If this touches you in any way, get in touch now. Who knows where all this is going? I'm dead serious about this. We have to switch gears now and we need everyone on board. Thanks for listening today. If you like what we're doing, please leave us a review on iTunes. It's the only currency the internet understands. And also, please do check out our beautiful Space Cafe radios and catch up on Space News Daily at Space Watch Global. Stay tuned, my friends. Marcus, over and out. Thank you.